All right, let's take a look at our 2013 chemistry free response questions number three. Looks like we're giving some calorimetry information. Student was assigned the task of determining the enthalpy change, that's heat of reaction, for an equation between magnesium oxide and aqueous hydrochloric acid, represented by the net ionic equation here. We used a foam cup calorimeter, polystyrene cup calorimeter, and performed four trials. And here is the data for each of those trials. Glancing, trying to glean information from the data table, a consistent amount of hydrochloric acid in each trial, one molar, 100 milliliters. The mass of magnesium oxide added, trial one to two, was doubled. Trial three to four was also doubled. We had a, a initial temperature and a final temperature recorded for each of the fall four trials. Let's take a peek of uh, A and B. What is the limiting reactant in all four trials? Assuming that all four trials is my word clue, so let me know I'm going to get the same answer no matter which one we take. Justify that with some math. And then look at the data of the trials and find which one is inconsistent with the other three trials. Identify that inconsistent data by simply drawing a line through the table and explain how you identified that. So let's first take a peek at what we know. I'm going to go to my work page. Here's the information that was provided for us. The balanced equation, solid magnesium oxide being placed into hydrochloric acid. Chloride, of course, is spectator, so it is being eliminated. The magnesium ion is now in solution and liquid water would form. Knowing that the hydrochloric acid was 100 mils and 1 molar, molarity times liter is going to give us the number of moles. So just hitting uh, 1 times 0.1. And we have 0.1 moles of our hydrochloric acid. Given the amount of to go back and find my data table. The amount here, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and so forth. So 0 0.25 or 0.5, we're going to just use the 0.25. It's the smaller of the two answers. And determine how many moles that is for our magnesium oxide. So 0 0.25 grams, um, just coming from trial one or three. Molar mass of MgO, I better add that in my head, 24.3 plus 16 is 40.3. Change that to a mole, and what do we find? So here we have um, molarity times liter gave us 0.1 moles for our um, mole of hydrogen. 0.25 divided by 40.3, and we're finding, hitting that for us, 0 0.0062. And just to even verify, um, even if we had used 0.5 mole instead, as uh, 0.5 grams, as trial number two had given us, we could still verify that magnesium oxide would indeed be the limiting reagent. So take 0.5 divided by 24.3 plus 16. And yes, indeed, we're getting a number that is verifying the fact that it is a limiting reagent. So that's 0.012, obviously, doubled that amount. So here's what we know, just to kind of clarify stoichiometric ratios. The balanced equation, a 1 to 2 to 1 to 1 ratio. We need twice as many moles of hydrogen as compared to magnesium oxide. Even with the larger amount, 0.012 moles of MgO. Two units of HCl required for every one mole. And we can clearly see 0.02, and roughly just given there, is all that's required of HCl. We have 0.1 mole. 0.1 mole is much larger than the required 0.02, telling us that this is in excess amounts, making MgO the limiting reagent in all four trials. To examine the data table to find which one is inconsistent, we're going to have to go in and find which one is coming up with the delta T's that are inconsistent with the others. From 0.25 grams and comparing this from trial 1 to 3, let's see what we're finding for a delta T. 
Trial 1's delta t would be 26.5 minus 25.5, that's 1 degree. So right here in trial 1, we get 1 degree. What kind of data is showing here? 25 grams, the 28.1 minus 26 is 2.1. So right away I'm knowing trial 1 and trial 3 are giving me inconsistent data from one another. Same amount of uh, MGO being used, but clearly a, a big difference. Trial 1 is just giving us 1 degree change. Trial 3 is giving us a 2.1 degree change. So it's one of those two. Let's compare what's going on with trial 2 and 4. Notice that's the same amount. So the um, twice the amount compared to trial 1. 29.1 minus 25 gives us a 4.1 degree change. Let's see if that's consistent with what we find in trial 4. 28.1 minus 24.1, and that's pretty close. Same, isn't it? That's 4 degrees change in trial 4. So 2 and 4 are in agreement with each other. So between 1 and trial 3, one of those is the outlier. So let's consider trial 3 to trial 4 we doubled. Did the temperature actually double as well, the delta T? From 28.1 and 26, that was a 2 degree change. And when we doubled the amount here, we indeed had a 4 degree change. That makes sense, doesn't it? Twice as much reactant having twice the temperature change. So all of this, kind of talking through why, trial 1 is indeed the outlier. So for our letter B, we need to explain how we determine that. Trial 1, and in, on your test you would have to say trial 1 is inconsistent. You would just be asked to draw the line there. And let's go through some of that uh, trial and error data that we had talked about. Trial 2 and trial number 4 should have delta T's, the change in temperature, that is two times larger than trial one and three. Since we doubled the mass, two and four, compared to one and three, we should have seen twice the temperature change. Delta T for trial one and trial, well, let's say trial uh, two and four were both four degrees, four and 4.1, so about four degrees. However, trial one and three offered the inconsistent data, so they should have been two degrees. Since trial two and four gave us four degrees, half the amount should have given us the temperature change of two, therefore, Trial number one only showed a delta T of one degree. It is the inconsistent trial. So we were able to determine trial one was the outlier. It only had one degree temperature change compared to trial three's two degrees. However, it is consistent with the delta T. By doubling the mass, we should have doubled the delta T. Let's go on and read parts C and D. We have to use the delta T's from one of the other trials. We have to toss out trial one. It's the one that is not valid. Assume that the calorimeter has a negligible heat capacity and specific heat of the contents. We'll use 4.18 joules per gram Celsius for the specific heat of water. And we'll also assume the density of HCl is one degree. We want to calculate Q, the heat, the thermal energy change when the magnesium oxide was added to the one molar HCl. Include units with your answer. So this looks like a Q equal MC delta T part. So here comes the letter C. Knowing that Q, heat measured in joules, is the mass times the specific heat constant times its change in temperature. Let's just identify that we will use trial two, just simply because it's at the top of the list. We tossed out trial one. Q, 
we have um, the, the specific heat times the mass times the delta T. So here we have, and keep in mind, let me bring that data table back up. We have um, not only 100 mils, which is 100 grams, but we also have 0.5 grams of magnesium oxide. So the combined mass would be 100 0.5 grams, and we have to make sure we include that mass in there. So when we add in the M, 100 from the water, 0.5 from the magnesium oxide, 100.5 is our M. 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius, the specific heat, and the temperature change from trial 2 was 4.1 degrees Celsius. Hitting that on our calculator, we get 100.5 times 4.18 times 4.1, 1722.4. Now consider your um, significant digits. We'll leave two in the problem since the data table uh, had two for the mass. So 1700 joules of energy. Alrighty. Reading on for the letter D. For, oops, wrong number. Determine the student's experimental value of delta H for the reaction in units of kilojoules per mole of reaction. So really we're taking a look at changing our answer um, from joules of heat energy into kilojoules per mole. So a little mole map work. So the 1700 joules, I know that there is a thousand joules in every one kilojoule. And we have to introduce the fact that uh, the 0.5 grams of magnesium oxide, we have to convert that into a mole unit. So again, using that molar mass, 24.3 plus 16, so 40.3 grams per mole. And that's just simply the molar mass. So 0.5 divided by that previous answer gives us 0.0124 moles. And so therefore we want kilojoule per mole, so I'm just going to reduce that value down here. So just kind of unit cancellation. Step one, joules canceled. We have kilojoule per mole as our final answer. 1700, divide by 1000 to move that decimal. Divide by 0.0124, and we end up with a kilojoule per mole. My screen says uh, 137.096, we'll just, again, consider significant digits. Heat was rising, wasn't it? Uh, temperature was being released from the system, so make sure that you are telling yourself you know that it is exothermic. Heat releasing with that negative sign. Enthalpies of formation are provided in this data table. Using this information, let's calculate the accepted delta H. So again, we're going to use heats of formation, products minus reactants, and see how well these um, actually agreed with each other, our experimental versus the calculated value called our theoretical. So in letter E, products minus reactants is our delta H. Always a good idea to show the formula you are using. Uh, that oftentimes earns you partial credit. So again, kind of going back to that data table, um, we could take a look at this equation too. MgO plus two units of H plus forming the magnesium ion and liquid water. And we do have two there for our stoichiometry. So let's go into the data table. Mg plus two, I'm just going to tabulate underneath. It's not the math setup, but I'd just like to tabulate underneath. This is negative 467. Hydrogen here has a uh, value of zero. Liquid water, negative 286. And MgO solid is given as negative 602. So we'll take products minus reactants. So we have negative 467 
plus the negative 286, there's the sum of the products, minus 602, the reactant MgO. And let's see what we find. Negative 467 plus a negative 286 minus a negative 602. And did you find what I had? Negative 151 kilojoules per mole. The heat of reaction using heats of formation. If the accepted value and experimental value do not agree, that's what is common in a laboratory setting, perhaps the calumet or leaked heat energy to the environment, would it help account for the discrepancy between the two values? Explain. So we get an opportunity to just simply explain possible sources of error. We had negative 137 as experimental. And the theoretical value, we calculated negative 151. So indeed, the experimental value is a lower value. I'm just writing that out. The experimental value is smaller than the calculated theoretical value. Could that be explained by a loss of heat from our calorimeter? Well, absolutely. We've lost heat. Our answer isn't large enough. So definitely this could help to explain the possible reason that our, um, that our calorimeter lost heat. So something perhaps like this. If the calorimeter leaked heat, the temperature would not increase. as much as, you know, as much as we anticipate it should, which uh, as much, I'll just leave it like that. How about just, it, it wouldn't increase as much as we anticipate. Well, we'll just put a comma. So if the delta T isn't as large, so kind of a step-by-step. -step. Delta T is too small. This makes calculated Q too small. And that's indeed what we found, isn't it? So therefore, since our delta H came out too small, the magnitude indeed would have been less. So really, you're just looking at an explanation to earn your points here. If our experimental value, 137, was indeed smaller than the theoretical or the calculated value, a loss of heat energy indeed could explain that. If the calorimeter was leaking heat, the temperature would not rise. Therefore, the delta T would be too small, and our calculations would show that the Q, the heat of reaction, came out too small. And there's the A plus on this answer.